Support for Louisiana, the state we're in, is provided by... Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Hello everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. Thank you for joining us for this very special edition of SWI. Traditionally, we end the year with an interview with the governor, but this year is a unique one. After eight years in office, Governor John Bell Edwards will leave in January. Tonight he reflects on his legacy and his impact on Louisiana politics. Take a look. It's almost over for you. You don't have much time left. How are you feeling? No, I feel good and uh, very appreciative of the opportunity that I've been given to be governor for the last eight years. Mindful this has been a very challenging but rewarding time and I'm certain I'm leaving the state in much better shape than I found it. And that's kind of what we all strive to do in whatever uh, profession we're in or, uh, you know, it's kind of like your parents, you know, taught you. You, you leave things better than you found them. So. Uh, I feel really good about those things and, and looking forward to what comes after uh, life as governor. Well, let's start from the very beginning. So you took office 2016 and you were quite literally a blue dot in a sea of red. Mm -hmm. Republicans had control of the House and the Senate and also you were the only Democratic governor in the Deep South at the time. But still, despite that, you've managed to push through a few major goals on your agenda. You increased teacher pay, Medicaid expansion, and also mitigating the budget crisis. Why do you think you were able to solve all of these problems during such a difficult time in the political world? Well, one of the reasons is I had served eight years in the legislature, and I had personal relationships with many members of the legislature that transcended any uh, political ideologies and so forth um, and divisions. Um, and, and those personal relationships can be very important. Secondly, uh, I position myself politically very near the center of the political spectrum. You know, I don't, I don't hang out on the far left uh, or the far right. I think, I think I'm where the vast majority of Louisianans are. And so the things that I was trying to do uh, were things that were supported by the state. And, and, and we were diligent. We worked very hard, we were persistent uh, because it wasn't very easy. Uh, we had many special sessions, for example, uh, to stabilize uh, our revenue so that we could actually fashion a budget that started to reflect the priorities of the people of our state. Um, and it was hard to do and so we, we kept going back into special session after special session. But at the end of the day, we were able to get there by working together. Um, and doing things that, that by definition had to be bipartisan uh, because, as you mentioned, I'm a Democratic governor, the majority of the House and the Senate were Republican. And when it came to revenue, almost all of that required a two-thirds vote, not a simple majority. Uh, and so very difficult to do, especially with a number of members of the legislature running for office pledging never to raise revenue under any circumstance, which I think is a real problem because they never uh, say, but by the way, I, I'm going to be cutting higher education or I'm going to be cutting K-12 through or we're not going to be investing in roads or health care and, and so forth. 
but in, in any event, uh, we did it on a bipartisan basis, and, and that was the key to our success. Uh, and, and I'm very appreciative of the work uh, that the legislature did, the relationships that, that I was able to build and to maintain. Uh, and, and really, it, it had to be a team effort. Uh, but we're in a much better place today as a state because of that. And it would, it would obviously uh, be an approach that I hope will continue in our state, but we need to see more of it around the country, and particularly in Washington, uh, where you don't see an awful lot of bipartisanship, even on the most pressing things, even on things where it seems like everybody's in agreement. Uh, it seems like there's this requirement that if it's proposed by a Democrat, the Republicans have to be opposed. And if it's proposed by a Republican, the Democrats have to be opposed. Well, speaking of hard work and bipartisanship, you came into office with one of the biggest financial crises that Louisiana has, has ever seen. It was a $2 billion deficit in the budget, which was inherited from the previous administration. What was going through your mind when you're walking in attempting to balance this budget? And this is the beginning of your gubernatorial career. Well, we knew that that was going to be tough, um, and we literally were a billion dollars short in revenue just to close out the fiscal year uh, that ended June 30th of 2016. The $2 billion was the shortfall for the year that started July 1st. Um, that's when we started going into those special sessions that I just mentioned. We tried, to, of those. tried very hard to take a, a balanced approach. Uh, where there was going to be a combination of budget reductions, but also revenue increases, um, and, and trying to figure out where we could get consensus around that. Um, and, and those are very, very difficult issues. But the primary reason I ran for governor is over the previous eight years before I became governor, we had disinvested in higher education more than any other state in the nation. We saw budget cuts across state government, but they fell most heavily on higher education and also on health care. I did not think that that was good for us. Uh, I saw us uh, under Governor Jindal's leadership uh, incorporating more and more one-time money in, into the budget every single year. And that's obviously not something that you can continue. And in fact, uh, that's why we developed that $2 billion budget deficit was all those one-time dollars. And that gig was up. And so it was time for um, I thought reasonable uh, a reasonable approach to, to governance that would restore fiscal discipline, uh, make sure we had the revenue to to uh, invest in our most pressing priorities, and and the first thing we did was stabilize uh, in in the state, and and we were able to grow our investments over time. And if you just flash fast forward to this year, um, we we have uh, uh, the largest investments ever in higher education, about $478 million more recurring for operations of, of higher education are all of our systems and campuses than we had when I became governor. We've increased teacher pay by $5,300 per teacher, half that for support workers over the last several years, the most general fund ever in, in early childhood uh, education, uh, pay raises for uh, firefighters and law enforcement officers and, and supplemental pay and, and so forth. Uh, all with a balanced budget uh, that that is in effect today. The revenue's coming in above the forecast for the current year. We had a $300 million surplus last year, and, and th this is the, the news I really wanted to talk about. We inherited a $2 billion budget deficit. In the budget stabilization fund alone, uh, there's a billion dollars today, the most it has ever been. And on top of the budget stabilization fund, there's a revenue stabilization fund that didn't even exist until 2016. It was created when I was governor. It has $2.2 billion in it. So, so done a lot since $3.2 billion. That's more than three times the most money ever uh, uh, in the bank accounts of the state in, in these stabilization funds. Uh, and uh, so we, we're in a much, much better place. It goes back to what I said earlier. You always want to leave things better than you found them. We are doing is, that in Louisiana. This is an example of that. But, you know, what I find interesting about the entire process of balancing the budget and going through that was how transparent this administration was. It seems like that's a theme throughout your gubernatorial career is making sure that people know and understand what's going on. In fact, you even reopened the fourth floor press room whenever it had been closed by the previous administration, allowing that communication with the press and the public. Why was transparency so important to you during that time? 
Well, we always tried to be straightforward and factual. Um, we were not alarmist, whether it was the budget, whether it was uh, natural disasters, whether it was COVID. Uh, we really believe in transparency. Um, and one of the things that I was very happy about was getting Jay Dard to be the commissioner of administration because he was able to put together budgets that were easy to understand. Now, some people may have thought we shouldn't have spent this much money in this particular, but you could look at that document and know what the state was going to be spending. Uh, it was very transparent and, and, uh, and so forth, unlike what, what the budgets had looked like before, because there were so many fund sweeps and one-time dollars that, that it really was hard to understand. And so transparency was important to us because we wanted to have the support of the people of Louisiana. We wanted to know what the situation in the state was, what our approach was going to be, uh, and, and let them follow along uh, all along the way. Well, the budget crisis was hardly the only crisis you'd have to deal with while you were in office. Also during that year in 2016, a, a no-name rain event, eventually dubbed the Great Flood. Yes, we all remember that. It hit several parishes in Louisiana and it cost millions and millions of dollars of, of damage. And then after that, that's we're not done, 12 name storms, with the worst one being Hurricane Ida and that also being the most recent. So at this point, you're no stranger to resilience and having to rebuild. But in your opinion, what's the most difficult aspect of disaster recovery in Louisiana? Yeah, well, first of all, it is, it is very challenging uh, under any circumstance. Every recovery is dependent upon an appropriation from Congress so you, you don't know how much it's going to be until after they appropriate it. And the language in the appropriation instrument changes uh, each time. And so the rules change. And so they, you have to wait for Congress to make the appropriation. Uh, and then the allocation has to be made to uh, Louisiana out of that overall appropriation. Uh, you have to read the language. And then, then the HUD has to, uh, through the uh, uh, Federal Register notice, uh, let us know what the rules are going to be. So it's a lot of moving parts. Oh, it's a lot of moving parts. But we have the most experience in the country. Um, and now we can't, we can't skip steps because you have to do things right. But it, it's just very difficult. But we are blessed to have really good public servants in Louisiana who have an awful lot of experience uh, across that whole process. And, and, uh, but, but I will tell you, um, the... Uh, storms that were that were that were the hardest to deal with were Laura in 2020 and Ida in 2021. Southwest Louisiana, Southeast Louisiana, the two strongest hurricanes to ever make landfall in our state, and it happened during the height of the COVID public health emergency. Uh, and so everything changes. How you how you shelter people changes. How you go out and inspect properties. How you deliver assistance. I mean, all of that was just much more. Uh, difficult uh, during those years, but again, very blessed by the just the wonderful public servants we have here in, in our state. Is there anything you wish that you would have done differently when handling emergency response? We do after action reviews after every disaster, and and we get with our federal partners, we get with people at the local level, all the offices of emergency preparedness, and we get all of our state actors, whether it's GOSEP, the National Guard. And we sit down and we learn from every disaster and, and we, we uh, make changes in our policies and procedures. And there, there's always some things that, that you wish you uh, had done differently or maybe uh, had done quicker. Maybe you took the right action, but you need to do a little quicker. Uh, but overall, I, I will tell you, I'm, I'm very satisfied with, with the way that we um, prepare for and respond to and recover from disasters in Louisiana, and, and we, the approach is pretty simple. We let the subject matter experts uh, uh, express their opinion, and unless there's some really strong uh, reason uh, to do otherwise, we go with, with those subject matter experts. And, and that's true whether it was COVID, uh, whether it, it's a forest fires in, that, that we've had uh, uh, this year, uh, it's the low water in Mississippi and the salt water intrusion, or, or hurricanes. I mean, it's it, that's just the approach that we've taken. You've had a lot happen during, yeah, during have, your tenure. Yeah. I just want to say, yeah. we're talking about forest fires, saltwater intrusion, not to mention all the hurricanes that we just finished talking about. But another defining moment in your career is handling the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and hindsight is always twenty twenty. you know the saying. Do you think there's anything that you wish you would have done differently when handling the protocol for that or that standard? Yeah, well, if you go back and you, you look at the, the situation in Louisiana, there was a time in late March, early April of 2020, when we the highest growth rate in cases being measured anywhere in the world, according to Johns Hopkins, was in Louisiana. Um, and so that was at the outset of the pandemic. And so I am certainly not an epidemiologist or an infectious disease expert, um, but we have uh, really good people at the Department of Health here in Louisiana who are. We have federal partners, uh, whether it's the CDC or, or at um, the White House, that, that the Coronavirus Task Force that was set up with Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci and, and so forth, Dr. Redfield. Um, so we just made sure that, that we were getting all of the best information we could about what the situation was in Louisiana, positivity rate, number of people in hospitals, the capacity in hospitals, uh, not just with beds and ICUs, but with staff. And it changed over time. And we had constant dialogue uh, with our hospital CEOs and medical directors uh, and so forth. And then we basically, uh, if you go back and, and look, the things that I did during the pandemic were consistent with the guidance we were getting from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. And, and so it's a, it's a novel coronavirus. Novel, by definition, means new. Um, and so nobody knows exactly what to expect, but you do have people who are subject matter experts uh, who are educated in these fields. And I think what you have to do uh, is you have to defer to those people. That's, that was the approach that we took here uh, in Louisiana. I believe that it served us well. Um, and, and so I'm not going to play Monday morning quarterback and go back and, and look at any specific decisions. I'm just going to talk about what the approach was. And then over time, as we learned more, there were things that we did differently. Um, and, and some, some things quite frankly, that we did extremely well, not just at state level, there were some pioneering medical approaches to, for example, getting people uh, off of uh, ventilators or never being put on a ventilator. Those, those things were developed here. There was other uh, approaches to um, testing. Uh, for example, we, we, we lacked uh, uh, some of the, the essentials for testing for the coronavirus at, at the beginning. We actually went to places like the vet school here at LSU and were able to, to get some of the materials and so forth. But um, I really don't want to play Monday morning quarterback. Enough people have done that. Uh, I, I will just tell you, I believe in science. I believe in the experts. When it comes to handling social issues and you know managing that public reaction, that's also a part of your job. And you signed a trigger ban into law that made abortion illegal in the state of Louisiana. This law does not allow for exceptions of uh, for rape or incest. And since the law's implementation, you've advocated for those exceptions to be added. And so far, they have not been. Do you have any regrets about signing that trigger ban into law without having secured those exceptions first? No. And, and I'll tell you why. And it's the same thing I said when I signed the law. What you skipped over is the fact that in 2006, before I was ever in the legislature, a bill was passed and signed into law that was a ban on abortions with no exceptions for rape or incest that specifically would go into effect if and when the Supreme Court ever overruled Roe versus Wade. So had I not signed anything into law, that would have been the same situation. The bill that I did sign into law, however, provided much more meaningful guidance on the exceptions that were available for the life and health of the mother and also the medical conditions for which a pregnancy could be terminated because of the non-viability of the fetus, uh, including uh, telling LDH to promulgate rules to identify specific medical conditions that doctors could then rely upon and so forth. And so the legislation that I signed into law was much better than the 2006 version. And as you stated, I do believe, um, and, I, and I think somewhere around 70% of the people in Louisiana consistently uh, support this idea, that there should be exceptions for rape and incest. I, I think we're gonna get there at some point in Louisiana. I hope it's sooner than later. 
Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is uh, we were going to default to the 2006 statute that was already on the books that did not have those exceptions. Uh, had I not signed that bill into law, but then the exceptions we did have weren't going to be very meaningful because the legislation didn't provide sufficient guidance to the public, to the doctors, and to the hospitals about when uh, the life and health of the mother or the non-viability of the fetus would come into place such that a pregnancy could be terminated. Well, continuing on social issues, the legislature voted to override those vetoes more than once. Were you surprised with their reaction? And also, what precedent do you think that these veto override sessions will have on Louisiana politics? I've been overridden twice, uh, once on the congressional redistricting. The Supreme Court has already invalidated uh, what the, the Republicans in, in the legislature did. So I feel certainly vindicated on that one. Uh, on, the, on the second one, uh, it, was, it was one bill that I vetoed, and it had to do with the provision of health care to minors in Louisiana for gender dysphoria. Um, and, and I believe that, that my veto was appropriate uh, simply because it is the standard of care for a very small number of young people who are diagnosed with this condition uh, and who after a couple of years of therapy for themselves and their parents, if their parents choose, uh, they, can, they can start taking uh, hormones. And there are over 30 medical associations who recognize this condition uh, and uh, endorse these treatments when it is appropriate. And, and so it is the standard of care. I don't believe the legislature has a, a role to play in telling parents that they can't consult with doctors and avail their children in these limited circumstances of what is the standard of care. And in the whole state of Louisiana, there's just a few dozen uh, young people. And so if you average it out, it's about one in 100,000 people that are actually going through these uh, hormone treatments. Now, what the proponents of the bill tried to do was act like we have a lot of, of young people who are undergoing surgery. They couldn't find a single example in Louisiana of a minor having surgery. It doesn't happen. Um, and so this was never about surgery. This was about whether the legislature, the state, or to interject itself into that situation and tell a parent that no matter what the medical community says, no matter what their particular doctor says, no matter what they believe is best for their child who has been diagnosed with this condition and undergone therapy and the, and the therapy for the parents, that, that the state knows better. I don't believe that's appropriate. Well, we've discussed a lot with your career. We, we've talked about the hurricanes, the pandemic, a fiscal cliff, and so much more. Out of all of this, what are you most proud of? You know, I say it all the time, and, and I mean it. We, the very first day, I expanded Medicaid. And so today, we have uh, upwards of a half million working poor Louisianans with health care who wouldn't have it otherwise. Uh, we did it in advance of COVID, so people were healthier than they otherwise would have been because they had a chance to get their diseases diagnosed. Uh, their medical treatments started, their, their prescription drugs started, so they were healthier uh, and were better able to withstand COVID. Uh, but it also has mental health uh, coverage. It has addiction disorder coverage, both of those, both inpatient and outpatient. And it also helped us to save money uh, and solve our budget challenges. And it goes hand in hand with, with, with first stabilizing our, our budget situation and then, and then being able to grow our critical investments like we have done. Um, and so I'm just extremely proud of those things. It, those are two of the examples that I use uh, routinely when I say how we're leaving the state better off than, than we found it. But the Medicaid expansion for me, and, and by the way, um, these are working poor people. If, if they did work, they would be poor enough to, to uh, qualify for Medicaid we talked about abortion a while ago. I'm a, I'm a pro-life person. I think that's borne out by my record. But for me, being pro-life is more than being anti-abortion. It means that you, you want people to have health care, especially your working poor brothers and sisters. You want them to have health care. Um, and so for all of those reasons, plus we have not had a single rural hospital close in Louisiana. All across the South, in states that didn't expand Medicaid, the reimbursement for medical services is so poor. Uh, that they've had hospital closures. We've not had one. Um, and so I'm very, very proud of that. 
Well, how will you continue to support Louisiana once you leave office? And is it possible that we could see you in public <laughs> office again? Well, I mean, it's certainly possible. That is not uh, my intention. I'm going to go back home to Tangeville Parish. Uh, Don and I have a beautiful home over there in Roseland. We, we love that community very much. Uh, I'm going to be uh, back in the private sector. I will practice law. I will do some other things. Um, and Donna's going to continue to be engaged. Uh, you know, she does, has done tremendous work uh, promoting a foster care program, promoting adoptions out of foster care, music, art, and movement in our schools, and then human sex trafficking prevention and awareness. Um, and, and she's going to continue to work in those areas too. So we're not going to be strangers. We're not moving. We're, we're invested here. We're, we're going to be grandparents. Uh, in just a few weeks, about the same time as we, we leave uh, the governor's mansion. Uh, and, and our grandchild is going to be here in Louisiana uh, with us as well. So we're not going anywhere. Uh, people are going to see me around. Uh, but as I leave office, I don't have uh, any intention of seeking elective office again. But I don't say never because I don't know what the, the future is going to hold. What do you want your legacy to be? Well. I, it would be awfully nice if, and I think accurate, if if my legacy is just one that, that sort of encapsulates what we discussed here today. Uh, worked really hard with anyone who wanted to work with me in good faith, regardless of party, in order to move our state in a positive direction, uh, to fix our fiscal situation, to invest in education, to invest in healthcare and expand healthcare coverage. Uh, to lead the state when we're, we're not going to be the nation's highest incarcerator. So really, that's what I hope the legacy is, that we, we left things better than we found them uh, and, and that I worked really hard every day and worked with anyone regardless of political party uh, if they were in good faith uh, and we more often than not found common ground and moved forward on the issues that were most important to the people of Louisiana. All right, well, it's been a very long eight years and you've done a lot. Thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking about this. No, it was a thank pleasure. you very much. Appreciate you. Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.